If you want to support Black-owned and operated businesses in the Grand Strand area and beyond, check out the networkconnects.com for a complete list of establishments in our local area. Our network connects Black businesses to community for a wide range of services, products, organizations, and resources that are viable in the African-American community. You'll find a wide range of products and services that'll fit your needs, along with information about events and happenings around the local communities. Check out the networkconnects.com. Connecting Black businesses to community. The networkconnects.com. Thank you for watching the World Community Magazine's Hour of Power Live on Facebook with your hosts Edward McQueen and April Garner. The sign said it's time for broadcast. I like that. Yes, it is time for another great broadcast. How are good you, good Brother evening. Edward? Yeah, yeah, good, good evening. evening. Good evening to our audience here. Wow. Um, uh, we want to welcome you to the program today. And uh, one of the topics uh, that's going to be coming forth to you today is, is one that uh, we is one of my favorite one of my favorite topics, uh, which I think don't, doesn't go uh, uh, far enough, far enough. So, uh, April, uh, my co-host April Garner, and I will be uh, talking with some uh, members of the mental health community uh, who uh, that representing representing one of the uh, uh, institutions in Ori County to what they call a have a highway to hope program and this program uh, it centers on uh, providing mental health and, and uh, primary services to our underserved rural communities uh, which is very lacking not just in Ori County but um, uh, really all over but this particular program 
um, it's being served throughout Ori County, uh, Georgetown, and uh, Williamsburg counties. And we're certainly glad that they had the opportunity to come on and, and be with us today to really bring us a little farther into our program uh, for um, this, this uh, ever so important topic on mental health, okay? Uh, this is my personal opinion. I don't think it's, be, it's being discussed enough um, in general. So uh, I'll, I'll leave the rest of, for that for April to say about that. You think we think we've said enough, April? Or you think we is a discussion is as um, you think there's a lack of of a discussions on this issue on this topic? I think that there's a lot of discussion that's happening. However, it's all about whether or not uh, the individuals in the communities who really need mental health are either you know seeking the services or have access to the services and that's Absolutely. always a really big deal um you know because and you know i think we've talked about it a lot whenever we've had other guests on uh to discuss mental health the fact that uh, a lot of times people kind of shy away from the topic of mental health and because there's a stigma behind it and uh for whatever reason it's been taboo in a lot of families traditionally and uh, you know, I don't know if that's prevalent across uh, races, but I know in the black community, people tend to shy away from from those discussions. And so, uh, you know, that makes it even tougher for individuals who need the help to get the help because they think there's something wrong whenever they need to get the help. But what's you know, the, the thing that's that's really wrong is not getting the help. And so, um, you know, our guests today are going to be talking about uh, their Highway to Hope program and how. Uh, it provides these types of services. And I was telling them uh, as the sh right before we were, you know, when we were prepping for the show that already uh, there was at least one pastor of a church who, um, and I don't, I don't think he'll care if I say his name, but Reverend Richard Williams uh, was very appreciative, said he was very appreciative of the fact that this particular program uh, is present at uh, his church, Mount Vernon. And so, uh, you know, that just goes to show that um, it's it's impactful and it's needed, and he was willing Absolutely. to put that out there. So, um, you know, what we're going to do today, of course, is uh, we're going to talk to three very special guests from Waccamaw Center for Mental Health about their Highway to Hope program. Uh, we want to remind all of our viewers if you have any questions or comments, you can, of course, uh, load them into the thread on Facebook or either yeah. uh, via yeah. YouTube. And we will get to the comments and moderate those comments and questions uh, as, as often as possible. Uh, and we're just going to have a great conversation tonight and get to meet some people who are trying to make a difference in the community. So I'm going to bring on to the stream right now. Uh, we're going to start with uh, Mr. Edward Robinson, and then we'll have Ms. Charmaine Gore and Ms. Aubrey Jackson. How are you all tonight? Hey! <laughs> Doing well. How are you? <laughs> look, look, April. April has made you feel comfortable already. I mean, That's yeah. right. <laughs> well, on top of it, you know, I love what I do, so it makes it exciting. Yeah. Thank yeah. you for having us on. Oh, you're very welcome. You're very welcome. Mm -hmm. So, um, I was, uh, you know, letting our well, we were kind of briefing each other. Uh, before the show came on and uh, was, you know, letting everyone else know that Charmaine and I go way back. We're actually high school classmates mm -hmm. and I'm just so proud of her and the work that she's uh, doing and the fact that, you know, we were able to connect and bring this topic to light because Brother Edwin and I are always covering mental health topics and we have guests on who talk about the topic, but this particular program is something different. I think this is what is really needed in our communities. And so uh, before we get into everything, what I, I want you all to do, of course, is to introduce yourselves and let everyone know what your roles are and uh, you know what you're charged with doing every single day through this program. So we'll start with ladies first, ladies first. Okay. Well, you got two to one, so. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's already exactly. So uh, I hope you all don't mind. I'm a little biased. I'm going to start with Miss Charmaine and then we'll go to Miss Aubrey and then we'll come back to Edward. Okay. Right. Um, hey, my name is Charmaine Gore. Um, I've been with Walk Mom Mental Health. Well, actually mental health for a couple of years now. Um, but I just been with Walk Mom Mental Health for mm, maybe some months. Um, and when I like I said, when Mr. Robinson called me and told me about the program 
And, you know, what we were going to do, it just made me excited, you know, because just the helping people and being out there and knowing they can't come to me and to go to them, you know, it just makes it all worthwhile. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, but I'm a clinician. Um, I'm, I am what they call a mental health professional with Welcome Out Mental Health. All right. Miss Aubrey, welcome. Hey. Hey. Thank you. <laughs> uh, thank you so much again for having us here. But um, I'm a clinician too, and also, yeah, mental health professional. And I work with children and adults. Um, and yeah, I'm very happy to be a part of this team. And we are so excited to just bring mental health to more rural areas because it is so needed. Mm -hmm. um, especially in South Carolina. Mm -hmm. And of course, Mr. Edward Robinson. <clears throat> so good evening. Good evening, everyone. I am indeed Edward Robinson. I have been with Wachmar Center for Mental Health. Wow. For it'll be 20 years next month. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> right. I've had several hats uh, now in a supervisory role. I am supervising the most awesome team. Uh, the Highway to Hope uh, team, brand new program. Um, and again, we're all very excited about it. We're all very excited about the work that we are uh, bringing to the community. <clears throat> well, this is excellent. And again, we appreciate you coming in uh, tonight to share this information with us. So uh, one of the things that I wanna make clear, uh, you know, as far as our viewing audience is concerned and anyone who wishes to share this information is that this particular program is not just for Horry County. Uh, it actually serves Horry, Georgetown and Williamsburg County. So, uh, you know, we're covering a very uh, large area, Brother Edward, with this information. And um, I think it's wonderful because uh, there was a flyer that was sent to us that kind of outlined some of the things that you all do. And uh, it also outlined uh, some of the locations across these counties where you where you actually provide these services. But, you know, before we get into that information, I definitely want um, want you all to explain a little bit more about the purpose, the services. And then, of course, let's get into the stigma of mental health. And uh, and then we kind of tie all of this together. So how how did you all come up with or where did Highway to Hope come from? What mm -hmm. you know, who was responsible for this particular program? Well, um, that was a kind of a short, long, short story. Um, the department uh, is a SAMHSA grant. Um, saw the need uh, after her, you know years of hurricanes and stories of individuals being unable to um, reach our centers, our clinics. Um, the grant was formed and uh, was given the name Highway to Hope so that we would be able to bring our services to the public. A little bit about Walk My Mental Health. Um, we talked about um, prior to broadcasting, just a brief history. Uh, Walk My has been in existence since uh, about 1967, I think it is, 54 years. And so DMH has been around much longer than that, 100 plus years. So um, Walk About Center for Mental Health, our catchment area, we are one of 16 mental health facilities uh, in the state of South Carolina. We cover three counties, Ori, Georgetown, and Williamsburg County. Um, we offer a large variety of services um, within our, uh, our catchment area. Uh, psychiatric services as well. We have doctors on, on, on staff. We have psychiatric nurses on staff. We have uh, adult and child uh, outpatient therapists. We have a school-based program. We have uh, a TLC, a toward local care program. We have a housing and homeless support, um, specialist. So we offer a wide variety of services. And the brand new program is this one, the Highway to Hope program. Um, and again, so the need uh, was realized that um, in the most recent hurricane, gardens, obstacles, rebuilding, um, for whatever reasons, they were not able to reach us, living out in the fall rural areas of the of the uh, counties, the Green Sea area, you know, the lowest area, Hemingway, mm -hmm. these areas, Greeleyville, these areas, mm -hmm. um, Lane, South Carolina, as, as Pastor oh, Matthew, yeah. uh, Chesterfield always talks about Lane, South Carolina. Mm -hmm. So these were very rural areas. And so um, it uh, um, since they not, cannot come to us, we will come 
come to them. So our program, in a nutshell, if I may, um, we're offering uh, outpatient therapy, adult and child th therapy. We're offering uh, psychiatric services. Um, we've seen a physician. We're offering uh, nurse uh, psychiatric services, offering peer support, care coordination, health care, primary health care services, a clinic that will be able to provide primary health care services um, to the public. So we too, again, offering a range of services. We are basically a mobile clinic. A mobile clinic. You're basically a mobile clinic is what you're saying. I think you're buffering just a little bit. Um, and that was the part that okay. was fascinating for me is the fact that you have this, you know, that mobile service, uh, which means that people don't really have to stress about coming to you. You're actually going to them. And I think that that's the beauty of this that's particular great. program. Yeah. So um, since you all have been set up at these various locations, uh, what can you say has been the impact of this this mobile outreach? Well, I mean, hearing from the patients that we serve, um, I hear regularly um, from the various. Um, I've heard from some patients that you know we're in literally walking distance from their from their homes. Um, they are, are able to better plan their day. Some of them work as well. Mm -hmm. Um, but able to plan uh, off time or uh, needed off hours from work. So, I mean, it's uh, we were getting some um, pretty positive feedback from the patients that we serve. In addition to that, um, the various locations in which we are providing services, we um, are receiving a lot of support from the uh, facility. You mentioned Pastor uh, Richard Williams. Uh, again, yes, we're using his church out in Green Sea, Mount Vernon. Um, very supportive of the program. We're using Spokes of Hope, uh, who is run by Shane uh, Zaccoli, very supportive. All the churches that we're using, um, they're very supportive and very welcoming to our program. Okay, awesome. So uh, <clears throat> let's, let's talk about the stigma um, of mental health. And, uh, you know, we were just kind of chatting it up a little bit about, you know, where that stigma possibly comes from. Uh, but it's pretty prevalent, as we know, uh, in, in certain communities more so than others. And so, um, you know, traditionally, I can only speak, of course, for the Black community or African American community, you know, there is a stigma in our community when it comes to uh, dealing with mental health issues. But I think that, you know, kind of rounding the curve a little bit and that we are at least having more conversations about it. So, um, you know, from Charmaine, from uh, you, your point of view and Aubrey, from your point of view, uh, you know, what's some insight you can give us on why the stigma exists, especially in the African American and Hispanic communities? You know, well, in the African American community, because um, we were we were always taught to be strong. You know, like you know, what's not going to kill you is going to make you stronger. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. um, if you got problems, you deal with it. You know, it's almost like a get over it complex. You mm -hmm. know, like you don't deal with things. You know, um, far as the black community and a little bit in the Hispanic community too. You know, they deal with it. It's more cultural for them. Um, it's a language barrier. Mm -hmm. So when you hear them words, therapy, therapist, um, psychiatrist, you know, that's like a taboo, you know, in a lot of communities. Um, you know, it surrounds this thing in the lang. Like I said, um, we got to realize everyone deal with life. Right. You know, we all have life. Um, inform everybody therapists had therapists <laughs> you know and <laughs> people find that hard to believe um that we do but you know just like everybody else we got relationship problems children problems you know there's rape death substance abuse in our families um you know it's it's just life itself with work and everything so it's just it's so much you know so to deal with it you know you keep in mind we deal with everybody's problems all day long and mm -hmm. then we still have problems ourselves too you know mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so the thing about it is when you come through to a therapist you have that confidentiality 
you know, you don't have to worry about telling your friend or your sister and, and they judging you and they like, oh, she crazy. Something must be wrong with her or, you know, like she can't cope. So right. it's not about that. It's about speaking your truth and getting some peace, you know, and a lot of people don't realize, you know, therapy is not forever. You know, you don't come mm. and say, oh, I've been in mental health for years and years. No, you dealing with something. We come, we set some goals, we target them. We, we, you know, we, we kind of coach you. We give you that. Come on, you could do it. And when you can't do it, we sit back and we say, you know what? It's okay that you didn't do it this time. But next time, let's just try to do a little bit better. So it's like we are support with just the non-judgment, you know? Right. And like I said, everybody realized everybody has stuff. And mm -hmm. it's just having that person you could talk to without you hearing it in the street or somewhere else. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Aubrey, what are your thoughts on that? I agree with her. Um, and it's kind of funny because we were actually just talking about this today, Charmaine and I, <laughs> um, <laughs> about, I was like, you know, I would love to have my own therapist. And it even came up in um, talking with a patient today who, uh, towards the end of session, he said, you know, I've been thinking about like how even therapists really cope with, you know, having like days where people come in mm -hmm. and say everything. And how do you leave it all like here? And I said, well, you really have to do a lot of your own inner work. Um, mm -hmm. So you're not triggered by someone and you're in your own issues and no longer with them. Um, so it's, yeah, mental health. Um, I mean, there's definitely still a lot of stigma around it. And I, I'm very happy to see that breaking down more and more. I definitely am seeing that, uh, but there still is. And yeah, with even that patient today um, talking with me about not feeling like his family is really supportive of him going to therapy or anything like that, feeling like he needs to. And um, this is a lot of thing I hear from men sometimes I work with, but mm -hmm up, be a man, <laughs> like mm -hmm. those kinds and, of things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Be fine and get through things when really, um, you know, like we're social beings, we're meant to process things together. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm sure that, um, just like you said, the therapist needs therapy. I know that you all mm -hmm. probably have to, you know, talk to a lot of people about their issues and I can only mm -hmm. imagine how much that, uh, how much weight that places on your shoulders, your mental, your heart, as you're trying to help someone filter through, you know, their issues and problems. So um, as you do this work, especially in the rural com communities where I can imagine that you're probably uh, discovering more issues than you mm -hmm. existed, you know, mm -hmm. how, how do you all maintain the balance so that you can, uh, you know, work with, with this, um, with these populations effectively? How do you do that? When Ed hired us on, like the first thing he told me was like, what kind of self-care do you do? That was part of the interview process mm -hmm. is he was like, what do you do for self-care? What do you do for your coping skills? Because he was very much like, you know, you have to have that in place if you're going to do this kind of work. And that is so true. So being able to really um, practice what we preach. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, uh, come up with that stuff. And I also get, you know, reminders too from Charmaine, like today being like, you know, take time for you, like do some good things uh -huh. for you. And it's wonderful to hear. And she's been, both of them have been incredible mentors in that area. So uh, you're both clinicians. Uh, I think you entitled yourself, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you must have some great challenges, you know, in, in, in doing your work. Like, what are some of, or or maybe your, your paramount challenge? You know, what, what is the greatest challenge that you, you think that you have to deal with? Not on a daily basis, but, you know, it could be infrequent, but, you know, mm -hmm. one, you know just one of your greatest challenges. You With, with the clients? Yes. Um, that's kind of two parts. Um, with with it with the parents like when it comes to children and mental health mm -hmm. a lot of times the parents are the biggest challenge um because parents don't realize when your children are in therapy you're in therapy mm -hmm. um but somebody always want to say fix my child 
but they have to realize a lot of things that go on come from the home or what they seen. Mm -hmm. So we as parents have to make changes sometimes, you know, and, and, and it's about them. They don't want to try anything new because they feel like you're telling me this stuff and it doesn't work, but it does work. It takes time and it takes patience. It's not going to happen overnight, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and dealing with adults, they're like so stuck in their ways and they like, I done tried everything. That ain't going to work for me. You don't know what you're talking about. But it's just like if you just take some time, some time to be consistent, you right. know, we have to do that, too, because sometimes we really do get inspired by our own advice. It's like, wow, I, why do I, you know, I, mm -hmm. what I just told them. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it does. It's so I think that's just the biggest challenge of people thinking that it's not going to work because it's not instant. You know, they want that instant gratification, mm -hmm. but it, it doesn't happen like that. So it's, it's continuing a, a learning process, really. Yes. Okay. Yes. You, you, you're still learning. Um, you, yes. you, 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 I, I wonder if the audience knows um, where the location is uh, of the Walker Mall Mental Health uh, uh, main main headquarters. I know you're serving three uh, three counties, but what is the address? Um, and you know what? That's funny. I have to get that because I don't have, I don't know that like off of the top of my head. I just know it's this drive down there on 501. I, I know. I have it. I have it for you. I got your back. I got your back. It's that yeah, one. Sorry it, about it, that. Brother, it, he always asks the, the difficult questions. Sometimes we don't, look, we're not writing ourselves and, and driving to our place. You know, it's 164 Waccamaw Medical Park Drive, 164 Waccamaw Medical Park Drive in Conway. Uh, and if anyone needs a landmark, if you are headed towards Singleton Ridge Road, uh, basically um, you can go on the roundabout and get off of that roundabout and then head uh, to the, the medical park center, which, you know, there's the, the lighthouses in that area and also the Waccamaw uh, Center for Mental Health is in that area as well. But I will put that up on the banner as well because I do have your phone number and your um, website address that I'm going to show everyone in just a moment. Uh, okay. Edward, yeah, uh, Mr. Robinson popped off. I'm going to pull him back into the stream. Uh, you okay over there? Yeah, I got kicked out. I don't know what happened. <laughs> okay, all right. It could, it could be an internet stability issue or whatever the case is. Yeah. So one of the things that you guys kind of touched on is the um, children uh, you know, in mental health and the issues that can arise uh, with children. What are some of the things that you've seen in, uh, you know, I guess the recent year, especially considering we were dealing with COVID? What were some of the, the challenges that you all had to deal with? Um, a lot of our kids, you know, they just deal with struggles. They deal with struggles of what's going on in their house, um, with what parents is dealing with, you know, it, everything is that financial stress. Um, you got them going through adolescence, they're growing up, um, expectations of school, home, you know, um, expectations with your siblings, you know, well, if they can do it, why can't you, you mm -hmm. know, things of that nature. Mm -hmm. Um, they deal with bullying, which Aubrey is going to touch a little bit more mm -hmm. on, you know, she's going to touch a little bit more on that, um, but they, they deal with things. And then sometimes kids is just like us, you know, they have low self-esteem, you know, and they don't, they just, they, they need that motivation, mm -hmm. you know, and, and like too, you have rape, incest, um, substance abuse in the home, you know, kids deal with a lot that we don't never think about, like that they're stressed about, you know, their depression and things are real. You know, the suicide rate has went down Although, you know, people are still looking at it like, oh, they, they need to get it together. They're going to be OK because a parent feel like if they buying them everything, they have games, they have everything that they want, that the child should be OK. Mm. You know, but they don't realize mentally they dealing with something because I heard mommy and daddy arguing last night or I heard my mama in the room crying that she can't pay her light bill this month. You know, these are the things, you know, what they say, all closed eyes ain't, ain't sleep. That's right. You know, mm -hmm. So, you know, the kids, they they do they go through a lot more than we can think about, you know, and it's just putting them, like I said, putting them back into it. And the parents know sometimes, again, we have to make changes as parents and adults. Don't that conventional okay. wisdom, um, that conventional wisdom, do as I do as I as I say, do not as I do. We can't do that. Mm -hmm. You have to set the example for your child. You can't tell them don't drink 
or, or don't smoke cigarettes and you sitting there lighting a cigarette mm-hmm. in front of them or don't do marijuana Absolutely. and they surround it yeah. by marijuana. Mm-hmm. You have to show them that example, you know, and I'm not saying like, you know, judging people for what they do, but don't do it in front of your children because you can't tell them not to, what not to do and you're doing it. As the saying goes, what they see, they'll they'll be. And it's true what they you know, what you do, they may do. And um, so you have to set the examples. And, you know, and one thing too, Charmaine, that I I, um, I know that parents struggle with. Sometimes they set the best examples, but Mm -hmm. children have outside influences that, you know, that they are also dealing with. And so, you know, it's a stroke for parents when they're dealing with those, you know, peer pressure and, and uh, things mm-hmm. that they're seeing on, on TV and in the movies that um, make them challenge their identity and their existence and all that other good stuff. And so, uh, you know, it, it sounds like, you know, the, the support that they need, uh, yes, it does need to come from the home and that parents should be cognizant of what's going on. But it's good to know that there's also a program out there that, you know, mental health offers programs that can mm-hmm. help, you know, parents to kind of deal with what they're seeing or at least what they think they're seeing and to come up with right. some solutions, right? Right, right. We have to go back to, we, we talk about this and I know that's going to be another segment because um, me and me and Ed have been working on some things, um, but we have to go back to, it takes a village to raise a child mm-hmm. and we right. have to start working with these children as a community mm-hmm. and letting them know just because you know we we have to let them know i'm here for you even though i'm not in your household if you need you know something so we need to get back to men we just need to get back to it takes a village to raise a child mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so the issue is the primary sound to me that the primary issue is getting the word out right so that's, right. that's the biggest challenge, it seems right. like. Yes. So uh, are you still exploring all avenues such as the, the uh, our program here that you that we have on today and other programs in order to, you know, really get that word out? Because it's critical. Yeah, it is critical. We've been, um, I have a good team. They've been uh, marketing and they've been reaching, they've been contacting individuals throughout the counties. Um, and so I'm, I'm, that's why I'm grateful for this platform here. Um, it reaches a lot of people. Um, so yes, getting the word out, get, helping everybody to understand that yes, it is like, excuse me, like Charmaine was saying earlier, you know, dealing with the mental illness, you know, again, we all have something that we deal with, you know, people deal with diabetes, people deal with high blood pressure, um, you know, whatever it is, you know. Um, so this is just another thing. So I mean, uh, to have to, um seek counseling to deal with a mental health issue uh there's no shame in it Mm -hmm. at some point we all need help therapy is good i tell everybody therapy is good for everybody you me president name somebody Mm -hmm. therapy is good for everybody everybody so at some point in our lives all of us will need help with something okay all right um and so uh yeah again um getting the word out is critical does does violence come into the picture at any point? Do you all encounter or interaction with uh, parents or or, or the the uh, the client themselves, the patient? I mean, there's there are situations that you know when you're dealing with the um, the individuals who has decompensated, the individuals who are um, when I say decompensated, meaning they are dealing with some sort of psychosis. And they may have some delusions going on. They may have some hallucinations going on. Um, we understand that uh, that behavior. We understand that at some point I may be talking to this patient. But as I'm talking to this patient, this patient may be experiencing an auditory hallucination, maybe hearing voices. Mm. That voice may be telling that patient that, you know, don't trust this guy. Don't trust him because he's, you know, somebody who cursed at your mom last week or somebody who, whatever it is, that voice to them in their head sounds as real to them as i'm talking to you mm. so uh that may cause some anger that may cause them to you know someone to act out that may cause some paranoia someone to not trust me someone to kind of you know want to say a few choice words um we have we, but we understand that kind of behavior and dealing with the history of certain patients we expect some of that when one is decompensating so yeah that's why we have trainings we're well trained to deal with individuals who um experience uh emergency behaviors like that it happens Mm -hmm. Um, But we have a great team. We are great at uh, verbal de-escalation. We're great at 
um, being able to talk someone through a psychosis, talk someone through um, uh, an aggressive act. Um, I've seen many, many interventions from many of our staff, um, from the you know executive director on down, um, that um, have been very impressive for talking to very upset, angry patients. One thing that we've been trained to do is to not take it personal, because we, again, we realize it's this is the mental health clinic, mm -hmm. and so when people come in screaming and cursing, yelling at you, guess what? You're not the target. There's something else going on. So we are trained to deal uh, with those kind of incidents. Mm -hmm. Good to well, see everybody comfortable, right, Abel? Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 well, you know, <laughs> it was a little, a little yeah. apprehensive about coming on. <laughs> That's a little stage fright, but the, the comfort level has has gone through the roof. But oh, you're comfortable. Yeah, absolutely. You're absolutely. comfortable when you know what you're talking about, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm trusting yeah. these people as the experts and the interventionists. Uh, who you know they deal with it every single day, so they know what is out there, and also um, you know they understand why it's important for the communities to take advantage of these services. So we're going to take a little quick commercial break, and when we come back, we'll talk more about behaviors and mental health, and um, you know uh, shed some light on Highway to Hope, uh, which is the the program that is reaching the underserved communities in Ori, Georgetown, and Williamsburg counties with our special guests. Uh, Charmaine Gore, Edward Robinson, and Aubrey Jackson from Waccamaw Center for Mental Health. So we will be right back. So Brother Edward, we are back and we have had a great first half of the show with our special guests from Waccamaw Center for Mental Health. And they're talking about their Highway to Hope program. But of course, we always come back from commercial break 
uh, to talk about some of the things that have been happening in the community. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, great so things. Great, great things. things. Great oh, things. Yeah, this day. <laughs> yes. Oh, man. So I um, want to mention and congratulate everyone across Ori and Georgetown counties who were instrumental in uh, planning all of the Juneteenth celebrations. And I can't leave out Marion County and Florence County. Uh, there was a little something happening all over the oh, area. Oh yes, in the PD yeah. and the Grand Strand. Um, there was the first uh, annual uh, Juneteenth celebration at Smith Jones Recreation Center. Bucksport held one. Burgess had one. Georgetown had one. Myrtle Beach had one. And I think Conway Myrtle Beach had two days of it. Uh, uh, Marion County had one. Uh, Florence had. Uh, it was just it was beautiful to see all of the activity. Absolutely. And, Absolutely. Um, you know, and it's great. And of course, as you all know, uh, Juneteenth is now a federal holiday. It was signed into law by President Biden. And um, there's so much history behind it. It's more than just a, a day to, to have a festival, a, a cookout or whatever. Uh, you really need to dig deep into the history of Juneteenth and find out why it's so important that that particular date and time uh, was recognized. So hats off, kudos to everyone uh, who uh, planned the events for for the public to come out and enjoy and certainly look forward to seeing more of that next year. Hopefully you can do like absolutely, a, absolutely. a yeah, huge one. one yeah. Bit. yeah. We, we kept to some of it, April. Oh, great. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, we kept to some and you're going to see it in our next uh, issue and our July issue of the uh, community magazine, Royal yeah. Community Magazine. That's awesome. Yeah. So along with the, 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 the great Juneteenth celebrations uh, in this past weekend, and I think it was the weekend before or two weekends ago, uh, there were a couple of residents uh, in Horry County who celebrated some milestone birthdays. And let me tell you something, if uh, God blesses me to live to be the age of any of these uh, any individuals, of it, it would be more than any. I could ever ask for. So. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So you were there for um, actually uh, both of them in a way because Miss yeah. Daisy had her 106th birthday 106, and I man. Yeah. Wow. And I have a video reel I'm going to play in just a moment. And then uh, Reverend Lonnie B. Chestnut Sr., my uncle, um, family. Hey, uh, he celebrated his 92nd birthday on this past Saturday. So, woo. And He's when you World War II veteran. And yes, World War II veteran. World he War actually II served um, in two branches of the military, I believe. Yep. Yes, That's right. Just yep. amazing individual, former educator, a pastor, wonderful dad, great uncle. You know, just everything that you would ever want in a person. He's such an amazing person and, and a powerful individual in our family. And uh, and I know that Miss Daisy also is a very um, treasured individual in her family as well. So brother Edward, you want to kick off this little video piece that we have here from um, Miss Daisy's celebration? Okay, go ahead. Uh, okay. Let's do it. Let's do it. It's good. I do love Jesus. And I love everybody. I don't know nobody I hate. It's just good. Every, every, Everything you've done for me. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let me Amen. tell you something. A hundred and six years old. Do you believe that? A hundred and six. She had, she had a lot more to say. <laughs> she, she, she had another 30 seconds of, of something to say. Uh, that's uh, Brother Daryl Stanley's grandma. Daryl Stanley, and Derek Stanley, Tanya Stanley, yeah, all yeah, the whole Stanley clan, yeah. exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, wow. it, it, absolutely it was amazing. Awesome. Yeah, the cars, the cars were lined up. I mean, around the block, coming around, just uh, just throwing gifts at her. When I say throwing, not literally, but you know. Yes. Uh, yeah, just and and they, and they um, you know, they're such a role model. Yes, I believe she's the auntie of my um, one of uh, our classmates as well, Lisa Cox. I mean, there, she, I just can't imagine what you, what, what she's seen in 106 years. She, can you imagine? <laughs> she's seen so it all, so all, brother Edward. She's seen it all. She, she's seen it all. Yes. She's seen it all. Uh, it's just absolutely amazing. And um, so I, I have uh, also, uh, I'm going to bring up um, a, 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 just a little picture uh, of uh, 
There he is. There's Uncle Lonnie right there in the top yeah. the right hand corner. Uh, his daughter Sandra, who uh, pulled everything together, she organizes. Absolutely, man. You know, she's, all she's, of these. Yes, she's awesome. She's awesome, and yeah. and uh, the family on the porch right here because he had a parade on right. on Saturday. Absolutely. Yeah, Absolutely. so his his sons, grandchildren, great grandchildren, uh, his daughter Barbara there as well all on the porch and of course, loving neighbors who uh, helped him celebrate 92 years old. Let me tell you something, he's got more swagger than, than Barack Obama. Yeah. He, he can outdress anybody. He's sharp now, sharp as a tack. Yes, somebody, yes, somebody. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. when, 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 the, when the city can can make, can make ensure that there is a, a fire truck, a fire and rescue truck coming to help celebrate his 92nd birthday. I mean, that says something, I mean. It says a lot. It, it was a parade of cars. Parade of, of um a police cars. I, mean, I think there was six or eight of them. Wow! But and uh, and <laughs> waking up the community with the siren. Exactly. I mean, you didn't know what was going on. Exactly. Well, I you know God bless both of them and um, you know, yeah and and uh, it's just certainly it's great that you were able to capture that. So I'm sure everyone will see that in the next issue yeah, of, uh, of, the, of the magazine yeah, as well. Yeah. So, um, Brother Edward, our, again, our guests have given us some really good information about the Highway to Hope program through the Waccamaw Center for Mental Health. And we're going to bring them all back into the screen now. Uh, we have Charmaine Gore, Arby Jackson. Uh, where is Edward? He popped out again. What happened? <laughs> 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 I, 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 was, I was thinking that he had gotten all comfortable with everything, right? <laughs> exactly. exactly. He's, he's comfortable. He's just, yeah, he's getting kicked off for but sure. Having some <laughs> internet issues. Oh, well. Well, uh, well, you know what? He's left the program in good hands with the both of you. So we're going to continue yeah, with our conversation. Yeah. So we stopped uh, at, at the um, bottom of the, the first half with a discussion about children and, and mental health. But um, one thing that I don't know that we went into in detail, uh, one of the talking points we want to hit today, the differences between children with behaviors and mental health. I think that's important because we want parents to, to identify what they're seeing correctly. So can you both explain uh, what the differences are? Um, you know, behaviors is when your child, like when you tell them to do something and they just, they're not listening and they, they consider them as to be defiant. Um, that comes from a lot too of not correcting your children when they're small, you know, and, and they grow up and you don't tell them no. And so now all of a sudden when they get bigger, you're telling them no and they're freaking out. Like, what do you mean no? Um, mm -hmm. You know, you never said this before. So mm -hmm. it's, it's all new to them. Mm -hmm. um, and they just don't want to do things. And like you said, I'll, I'll let Aubrey get into the other part of it. But it's like I said, it's, it's like it start rearing them early um, when they just having them behaviors. Mental health is when they start struggling with stuff, um, when their self-esteem is low. Um, we consider like, like trying to build their self-efficacy skills. Um, have they been molested, abused emotionally, physically, you know, or again, bullied in school or dealing with prayer? peer pressure, um, those are the things that weigh heavy on a child's mind and, and you know, kind of it makes it hard for them to control um, and they don't know how to deal with it. And it's not that they can't talk to family or parents, but a lot of times kids don't talk to their family or their parents. And it's not the fear of what they're going to say, it's their reaction. So when you tell your child something, it's like, what in that reaction? You know, so we as parents have to learn how not to react and be like, oh, OK. Even in your mind, you screaming like, whoa, hold up. But it's that reaction that you give them kids, because once you start giving them that reaction, now it's like, I can't say that. I can't tell my mom that they're going to freak out. So it goes back to us teaching them children how to and the parent how to effectively communicate with each other um, and make them comfortable to say what they want to say. That's why we have to pull a parent in to let the parent know, be mindful of that reaction. Um, go in the room and scream after they finish, but don't give them that because that makes them not want to come talk to you about mm. something. Mm. Well, what do you think about that, Brother Edward? I, I, you know, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm just with the experiences that you all are sharing with us. It's enough to keep everybody on here for another two hours. Yeah. 
Yeah, <laughs> and, and, and because I think people need to know like what you all are experiencing just to kind of uh, imagine uh, what goes on in, in these homes, you know, and, and when we meet somebody, we don't know what they're going through. Okay. That's we right. We don't know what they're going through. And sometimes you we're prejudiced about the situation, you know, uh, not for race or anything, but you just, we're prejudging mm -hmm. just by what they've done or what they've said. And we just don't know, you know, what they're experiencing at home. You know, um, I don't know how to rectify that. I don't know how to address that, but uh, you all are certainly shedding some light on, on how it, it how prevalent it is, mm -hmm. and I think that says a lot. That that um, the magnitude of that uh, is is to the point where uh, it um, it needs to be continuing uh, to in in um, in existence. You know, in discussion. Mm -hmm. um, something you said is really important, brother Edward. When you, when you made the point that you don't know what people are going through and. I'm, I think back immediately to what's happening with the um, the track star who just made the Olympic trials uh, or went through the Olympic trials to get her slot in Tokyo, uh, Shikari Richardson. And, um, you know, media had a field day with her when she was on the track doing her thing and talking about how she looked and all this other good stuff, not knowing that this young lady, only 21 years old, lost her biological mother, was raised by her grandma, was dealing with a lot of different things. And when she was done with her race, you know, the first person that she went to up in the stands was her grandmother. She just collapsed in her grandmother's arms for that love and that support. And it just makes you think about the fact that people are quick to judge. And instead of trying to really understand what uh, or, or to just have empathy and to understand that people you know, could be going through anything at any given day. And the one thing you say or do could trigger them in, in a you know very negative way. And so, um, you know, it's great that she had a support system there because I'm sure that her new stardom is going to take its effect just like it has um, for, I can't call the young lady's name, but the tennis star who refused to talk to the media. You know, that's her business. If she don't want to talk to the media, why, why give her that pressure? Uh, she's doing what she's supposed to be doing. She's playing and she's winning and, you know, let her, let her deal with her own world in her own way. Uh, but there's so many people who don't have, uh, that type of support system. And when you think about what's available to folks who can reach it in the city limits versus people who are in the rural areas of the underserved communities who have to deal with stuff day in and day out and they don't have an outlet, it's, it's you know, it's a little scary. So, um, Charmaine, you've, you know, put out some really informa or important information so that hopefully parents who have to deal with the cycles of behavior versus mental mm -hmm. health can you know go back and kind of think about it for just a minute, marinate on it, and and yeah. try to discern whether or not it is a behavior or they're seeing a pattern that could be a part of mental illness or something like that. So, um, uh, you know, um, one of the talking points here is about natural support, and so one of you want to explain to me what that entails as far as mental health is concerned. What is natural support? <clears throat> So natural supports are uh, the things that we uh, use every day. It could be family, it could be our friends, it could be your pastor, our church um, church members. Um, natural supports are those things that um, when you, when anyone is going through some kind of life stressor, um, they could lean on someone else, okay? Um, we encourage people to you utilize their natural supports as well um, as professional therapy. Um, one of the things that uh, Charmaine said earlier is that, you know, therapy is meant to be uh, short term. Mm -hmm. So when we come to us and we provide the service and you get to recovery, you've recovered from, you know, the, the, um, the situation that you came to see us about, you still need natural supports once you um, exit our services. You still need family, friends, you need your, your, your clergy, you need uh, your job, you know, coworkers. You need those kind of natural supports to kind of help you to keep moving forward. Mm hmm. Yeah, and when they don't exist, I'm sure it's, it's tougher for someone to cope and and to deal with things. Family therapy for children. Uh, talk about that a little bit. Mm -hmm. So, are you, you gonna have this, Charmaine? 
I, I was I was waiting on Aubrey. I, I yeah. was like Aubrey was going to answer too. She said, mm -hmm. "I can't, I can't." I mean, I yeah, I don't want to step on Charmaine at all either. Um, I do have some talking points, but um, yeah, family therapy. So for family therapy, what I like to do in sessions when they come in is really um, establish what the rules are going to be in that space <laughs> because as a therapist in family therapy you tend to take on the role of almost a referee um because i haven't had a first session anyway that hasn't it gets very heated um it, it can definitely and then being able to stop and pause the person and have people say their piece. And um, also in family therapy, really coming back to, okay, what is your role in this family? What are you wanting? And asking both the children and the parents what they're wanting is a really important thing. And also being able to really gauge if the child or adolescent is more comfortable with their parent in the room or not. Um, with some children, uh, especially adolescents, if they're a little older, like maybe 15, 16, I tend to, they don't feel like they have a whole lot of uh, control. So I tend to say, okay, when do you want your parents to join the session beginning or end? Like what feels best for you? So they have a little bit of that piece because they may not even want to be there mm -hmm. and they're you know having to go. So I want to make a good experience for them. So they associate that with therapy and come back. Mm -hmm. And um, they may share something with me that they weren't really comfortable sharing with a parent. And then we can pull them in and I can kind of be a little bit of a mediator for that. Uh, family therapy is extremely important because the person's environment, whether they are a child or an adult, is so important for their mental health and for their progress and consistency um, afterwards, after treatment is completed. So when our families go into therapy and, um, you know, you make your assessment that treatment is needed, how, how often, or, or I won't say how often, how long uh, do most patients or clients have to stay in treatment? Is there like a a, a limit to it? Or is it just whenever you reach the goal that you've set for them? How does that work? Yeah, it just depends on the person. I mean, mm -hmm. some people may hit those goals really fast. Like I started working with one individual, I believe I saw her for the first time in maybe April, and she's already just <laughs> done incredible in like such a short amount of time, and really doesn't need a whole lot more like she's paying treatment goals and everything but then for other people it does take more time so that depends on the person it really does it depends mm -hmm. on the person um but it's really good to come back and assess that with patients and ask them and yourself you know like am i giving more are they giving more because therapy is a two-way street like you don't want to be putting in more input than the patient is. And you don't want the patient putting in more input than you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And can I just say one thing about that? Because Aubrey yeah. did an awesome <laughs> job. Mm -hmm. um, you made the comment, April, of, of the goals that we make for them. Um, we don't make our patients goals. We ask them what right. would they like to achieve and what they want to accomplish. And we, we ask them what can they do to make it to this goal. And we try to start off small. So we let them set their own goal and we just kind of nudge them and encourage them to mm. get to that goal. And when they struggle with it, we try to help them figure out why and say, well, if you're not meeting this goal, how about let's reassess this and let's go back and try something different. Mm. So it's always client focused. What I want them to work on sometimes is not what they want to work on. So we want the client to work on what they feel comfortable with to let them feel like I'm, I'm achieving this small goal. So now I can achieve something bigger. Mm -hmm. And it, that's that personal accountability, too. That's, that's good. right. Yeah, that's, that's, right. that's really good because. Uh, if I may, yeah, go ahead, Edward. Mm -hmm. If I may interject, one thing I like about family therapy is when you realize that uh, in any family, you know, it's, it's, it's a system. 
everything in the system, just like you have a solar system, everything has its place, its role. Um, the dynamics of a family, when you begin to look at its system, what role does the, does the dad play? What role does the mom play? The sibling, you know, the, ch the children. So if you have a, a family coming in with an identified quote unquote problem, let's say the child is the identified uh, patient, identified problem, you know, you look at the system. What we're in a system. You have what the family all there together in the same room. You know, again, not to isolate anyone, not to make anyone feel like you're the problem, you're it. But you begin to speak openly this with family members, and you begin to look at how does this family member A interact with this family member B, how do they interact? And so, um, when you begin to look at, for example, if a child is acting out, the parents may think, "Oh, wow, this child is, you know, just had his behaviors." The X, Y, and Z, they're not doing well in school. Everything's happening. And they, in the child's mind, dang, I'm the problem, right? Mm. <laughs> but when you come to family therapy and you begin to speak to the system, you begin to look at what the mom's doing. How mm. does the mom contribute to the problem? How does the dad contribute to the problem? How does the child contribute to the problem? You may find out that the child is acting up because the husband and wife are in turmoil. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they're having this conflict in husband and wife. And now, the child has taken on the role of acting out so that the parents are no longer fighting with each other. They're now focused as a team on the child. Right. But, but in a the child, they fix the problem because then the parents aren't fighting. Mm. So it's interesting when you look at a, a family dynamic, family system. I love that about family therapy. There's always so many different avenues to take, so many different ways to look at a perceived problem. And it, 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 you know, what you just described, it just sounds like it could be the most toxic situation because, you know, because the child is actually processing it that way and fixing it in their minds, it's never fixed. It's just mm -hmm. they, it, it's kind of like, you know, well, let me, like you said, let me pull the attention this way, focus on me, but the child is still wounded. They're still hurt from, mm -hmm. you know, from the experience of watching their, their parents argue or whatever the case is. And, you know, that kind of, thing does not go away when the person stops being a child. There are people who are 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s that are still dealing with issues mm -hmm. from from how that you know things that they witnessed when they were raised or whatever. So Absolutely. yeah. Absolutely. So, so uh, uh brother Robinson um do do you ever contemplate um not just with with a van uh, just taking it to the different communities but holding forums uh, will some of these churches allow you? I know you were working with Mount Vernon uh, with uh, 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 Reverend Williams, mm -hmm. um, but do, do you think you can do it on, on, on a um, rather whole, wholesale basis, uh, you know, a greater basis than what it is now? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure of it. Um, I know that uh, Pastor, uh, um, Lord have mercy. Let me, let, let me, I'm going to go to your Chester flyer. Field. Yeah, there you go. Chester Chester mm -hmm. Pastor uh, Matthews. Yeah. Pastor Matthews, um, he's good about, um, you know, allowing us to hold forums. And so we've done similar forums in the past, not only for mental health, but an, uh, an all-inclusive kind of forum. But I think you're absolutely right. Um, uh, we, could, we could use our RVs once we get them, bring them around. We could hold forums at various churches uh, to kind of speak to the congregation and the people of the community at right. large. Uh, so they can come and ask questions. They can come and you know, uh, speak probably to us. So yeah, I mean, I am not opposed to that at all. Well, uh, I, th I think we could become available to assist you in in, in in a number of ways, if you can think about it, ways that uh, the World Community Magazine can do so. Um, I'm sure April would, uh, would agree with me on that. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So if we if we, we can work with you in a, in a more cooperative way and to uh, come up with, with, with some kind of form or whatever, we certainly be. I think we'd be glad to do that. That'd be awesome. Okay. Um, your your experience that you've talked about, uh, it shows because it sounds like you know exactly what you're talking about. And <laughs> so, <laughs> congratulations to you on that. I'm glad we have you on the program for that. Really. Thank you. I have a great team. Thank you. And so I, I put your flyer up so that you can. Um, 
everyone can see a little bit more uh, information about the locations across Ori, Georgetown and Williamsburg County. And so uh, there was a question from one of our loyal viewers, Priscilla Fuller, um, you know, she was kind of going into this, uh, you know, idea of, of finding more partnerships with churches and you actually have partnerships with churches and I'm, I'm hoping that that will grow. Uh, and and uh, Spokes of Hope uh, on, in Longs on Tuesdays, you're there, Mount Vernon, uh, in Nichols, you're there on Wednesdays. Uh, Loris First Baptist Church in Loris, you're there on Thursdays. And then Chesterfield, you're there on Fridays, all in Horry County. Uh, in Georgetown County, you're at the Choppy Center Monday through Friday. And in Williamsburg County, you're at the Chavis Complex in Hemingway, Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays. And in Greeleyville, uh, you're at the Greeleyville Recreation Center on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And you know, so again, you're covering a lot of ground and I'm sure it's overwhelming to think about how much more you could cover and how many more locations you could add. And now Brother Edward is giving you some work to come up with some forums and all that good stuff. But I guarantee you with the right partnerships, you you all can, yeah, you all can make this, um, you know, an extremely powerful and impactful program all across uh, these counties and across the state. So, um, you know, and it's all about accessibility. And, and making Absolutely. sure that yeah, that's, that's, that's the key. And it's all about accessibility. That's the key, to me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and you know, and one thing I love about my team is that we. I mean, it's amazing that I have hired a group of people, and we all share the same level of high enthusiasm for serving the public. I mean, um, this is just part of the team. We have more team members, but we all share the same high level of enthusiasm when it comes to taking our service to the people. They are, they are so motivated to. Helping and so and I love it. I appreciate them for it. That that, that I'm sure that makes the job a whole lot easier. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and everybody's on sync like that. So absolutely. Yeah, congratulations to you guys, man. Really. Um Thank there's, you. yeah, there's a question from a, a viewer. <clears throat> Are there services for someone who does not have Medicaid ins or insurance? Mm -hmm. That's correct. Yes. We we accept individuals without medication, without Medicaid, without insurance. Without Medicare, we accept private insurance. Uh, yes, we we do not um, hesitate to provide services for the um, individuals without insurance. Okay, all right, awesome. And then, of course, um, Sister Joella McQueen, who is Brother Edward's better half. Okay, okay. <laughs> Look at how big he smiles when I say that. Uh, she offered a comment today about the show, and it is important that uh, everyone understands that you know this help is available, and especially if it's needed for the children. And um, yeah, this is this is awesome just sharing all this information. And uh, yeah. again, uh, I'm tickled to death that there is a program that is reaching the rural communities. And so, uh, if someone wants more information, needs more information. Uh, of course, I put up the slide uh, just a moment ago with some contact info, but I'm going to put this banner up as well. Uh, so there's the phone number and also the website for Welcome on Mental Health. Uh, you can uh, call and I would imagine that you'd want them to reference the Highway to Hope program so that they can yeah. be directed to the right persons. Uh, that's but, okay, awesome. Yes. And again, uh, this is a program that's offered uh, through Waccamaw Center for Mental Health that provides mental health and primary medical services to individuals in underserved communities. So uh, if if you know of a community that needs this help, the community may not even know it exists, you know, yeah, let, the, right. yeah, you know let the let the folks at, at uh, mental health and with this program uh, know some of the areas that probably need to be prospected and hopefully they can put it on their radar um, you know, you mentioned something about some RVs. Are you all trying to get more, uh, you know, more vehicles on the road to go out to more areas? Or is this part of your fleet or what are you doing? Brother Ed, Did he get stuck? I think he's stuck. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. They're kind of getting, um, they're going to, they want to pull in RVs to actually make it, you know, like he said, the mobile clinic. Um, mm -hmm to just kind of let people see. I think after we get out there, we're going to end up keeping one RV, you know, for each community. And mm -hmm. then we'll take that RV to do different events. Um, but the main thing is now everybody is going to kind of get one just so people can see that we are out there. So mm -hmm. it's almost to like a form of advertisement. So you can see it down the highway and see us park you know, mm -hmm. at some of these locations. So it was like, you know, what's that? And so that's mm -hmm. another way to, um, to help as far as advertising what we are doing. 
Okay, well, awesome. Well, I know I posted this particular comment in the beginning, but I'm going to post it again. Awesome. Much needed for our community <laughs> from Brother Eugene Bellamy Jr. We appreciate you for watching. And uh, I don't know if Edward Robinson is going to pop back in, but we'll give the ladies the, the last word from Walking My Center for Mental Health and Highway to Hope. Uh, and again, we thank you both for being here tonight. So thank you, Charmaine and Aubrey. Y'all want to, you know, give a shout out to anybody? You want to, you know, give a another plea for people to make sure they connect with you? What What would you like to do, Aubrey? You go first. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I just first of all want to say again, thank you so much for allowing us to come on here, and I appreciate everything you guys are doing too. Seeing your advertisements and everything. It was so touching and getting to hear some news that's not just depressing because I know things really have been <laughs> um, hearing the news of people celebrating their birthdays and just, gosh, the sweet, sweet soul sharing about <laughs> just how happy she was. Mm -hmm. um, it was beautiful to see. But yeah, I just want to also share that um, we do serve as many people as we can um, to come see us, that there is um, you know, nothing to be afraid of when it comes to mental health and talking to someone about things. Just having that extra support is so needed, whether the person is an adult or child or wants to engage in family therapy, whatever it may be, that um, you know, we're here for you and you don't have to go through it alone. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. And I just I, I just like I said, everything Aubrey said, thank you all for this opportunity for letting us, you know, almost kind of like share our story and, and what we do. Mm -hmm. um, just one shout out to like, for you know, clients and, and children and teachers. Mm -hmm. And like my son is a school teacher. And when we think about our children, um, you know, I, I hear people so often like these kids is bad and they don't want to listen. And my son is an awesome school teacher. So give him a shout out. But then also, too, it gets trying for him when these kids don't listen. But I reel him back and I, and I have to remind him, like, you don't know what that child went through last mm -hmm. night. You don't know if they heard their parents fighting or if they didn't have a meal or if they slept with no lights on. So you do always have to take that in consideration um, and start just taking a little bit more time with our children and figuring out what they need because they're into so many other things. Um, and because we're not communicating and we're not there for them, you know, it sets them up for all of these other things. So I just want us to just bring back and think about what we could do for the community. Think back about what we can do for our kids. Mm -hmm. I mean, and, and each other. Because um, all it takes sometimes is just a little bit of kindness. That's you know? right. That's right. Be kind. How That's about it. How about you, Mr. Robinson? You pop back in again. <laughs> we're, we're giving you guys the, the last word for Highway to Hope. And a shout out if you want to do it. And a shout out. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, thank you all for having us on. Um, I really appreciate that, this opportunity. Um, again, I said, you know, uh, I am, I've been at Wakama for 20 years. We've uh, done some great work. We've, we've had a lot of great programs. I'm really excited about this program. Uh, I love this team. I'm excited about the work that they'll be doing. Um, I'm excited about getting into the, in the into the communities. Um, there's a lot of work that needs to be done, a lot of work that needs to be done. We do, you know, eliminating the stigma, getting help to everyone needs help. So we have a long way to go. Um, I think this is a great program, and I think it should, you know, it'll be around. It should be around for for a long time because it's, it's well needed, yeah. much needed in the community. Awesome. Well, great, thank you. Great. Yes, thank Fantastic. you all for being with us, brother Edward. You can have the last word. I'm just gonna, we're just going to sign off. That's the last word. <laughs> <laughs> sign off. Right, and and I, I really hate for this conversation to, to cease, but but uh, because in fact, we've gone over, over 16 minutes or so uh, beyond the hour, but it, the audience, I'm sure, is, they know that it's worth it Okay, yeah. to, to get this kind of information. Yeah, they and, held um, in there, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Thanks. yeah, and, and we hope to see you guys back again uh, uh, in, in the future. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, okay. to come up with some some more uh information if we left out anything you, you won't find out that you left out anything until the program is over with and you <laughs> get you home. I should have said that <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. but, yeah but that's life so but anyway um, uh again to our audience uh, uh hope, hope that um you we've shared with you the um the 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 uh 
some, some experiences. Um, and number one that was focused on with this April uh, touched base on was the stigma. Uh, this thing being stigmatized in our community. And uh, hopefully this has shed some light on trying to erase it or at least, at least dilute it a little bit so that, you know, when you're next approached with anybody, uh, you look at it, look at it in a different light. And I just, <laughs> just hope and pray that that, uh, that has rubbed off on you, okay? Based on our discussion here today. So April, um, we've had it. This is yes. the last, so um, yeah. <laughs> well, right. Well, well, we'd like to thank everyone for tuning in tonight. And of course, join us next week here, Monday at 7 p.m. Uh, of course, stay tuned to social media, uh, YouTube, and also wcmagazine.net for an announcement of who our guests will be uh, for next Monday. Uh, and again, we do appreciate everyone's support. So thank you and have a good night. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Good night. Bye. Thank you for watching the World Community Magazine's Hour of Power Live on Facebook with your host Edward McQueen and April Garner.